Hello everybody, Thaddeus here, coming to you with the first video in a new video series of potential interviews. Uh, you can see that we're in a completely different setting, yet to be seen, and we have a guest. And this is my mother, who is also a former Jehovah's Witness. Uh, say hello. Hello. And introduce yourself, if you will. My name is Michelle, and I am mother to this fine young man. So tell us... How long were you in the organization? I was in the organization for basically 40 years. I got baptized in 1988, but obviously had been attending meetings prior to that. All right. And what, like, how did you get introduced? Were you raised in the organization? <clears throat> uh, my parents started studying the Bible when I was around 10. Um, I don't remember their initial study. I didn't really understand what was going on at the time. They probably studied about a year before they started bringing um, the whole family to the Kingdom Hall for meetings. All right. So what was your upbringing like? What attracted you to, quote unquote, the truth or the Watchtower Society? Um, it was very attractive to me for a young person. Um, the family that I grew up in was, was a lot of fighting. Um, and my parents were, there was drugs and there was drinking. They were in a rock and roll band and they played bars on weekends, um, a significant portion of the time. There were parties at the house where there was a lot of drugs, drinking, um, the bathroom literature was Playboy magazines. Uh, we had pretty free access to whatever was on HBO. HBO was pretty much brand new at that time. And with my parents gone, there was not a lot of supervision. And not having my mom home as much, um, I, I really wanted that traditional family, um, the security of having you know, the mom home, the dad working, but it was a very volatile situation. And I also had a really strong spiritual desire. My mother had taught me to pray when I was little, but it was like the, now I lay me down to sleep prayer. Um, as I got older, she told me I could pray to him. It sounds more like a Metallica song <laughs> yeah, than a, right, right. an actual religious kind of prayer. actually but... a pretty terrifying prayer if you think about the words, but... Um, she did teach me as I got a little bit older to, I, that I could talk to God about anything, but there was no spiritual guidance at all. And she was raised Catholic. And when I would visit my grandparents, which was like my safe place, the best place in the world, they would bring me to the Catholic church, which I loved the idea of going to church, but I recognized during the services, because I grew up in a family with a lot of drinking and stuff, that the priest was drunk. Um, my grandmother didn't appreciate me pointing that out, that the priest was drunk. <laughs> um, Somebody's uh, breaking into the sacramental wine. <laughs> yeah, right. Is that a Jewish term? I, I think know. we usually went to like the third service of the morning on Sunday. And by then, yeah, he, he was lit. And... I grew up in that environment, so I recognized it very Maybe he was drunk on the Holy Spirit. <laughs> well, no. Maybe. Okay. Maybe. And it also bothered me that I couldn't understand anything with what they were saying. It's like you stood up, you sat down, you shook your neighbor's hand, um, you repeated the same. Everybody repeated the same thing. I don't remember. Was it ritualistic? <laughs> very ritualistic. And Did, did they read in Latin or... Some of it, yeah, because I didn't understand pretty much anything that was going on, and I wanted to. Um, so in school, I had um, a couple friends who went to CCD. Um, I can't remember what it stands for. It's something to do with catechism or something like that. It's a long time ago. <laughs> um, but they they invited me to go, and I really wanted to go. They had... And then there was like 
wherever it was that they went for this, there was craft days. And I don't know, I just really was attracted to community. Yeah, community stability and spiritual spirituality. spirituality. I really was interested in that. Especially because my home life was um, volatile, I guess you could say. I mean, I have a lot of good memories, but those particular aspects of my life were very um, chaotic. Yeah. Unstable. Yeah. And looking back on it, there was, I didn't feel safe because of the circumstances we were put in. Um, and some bad things did happen. So it was not a lifestyle I was thrilled with. So when I was introduced to Jehovah's Witnesses, being able to learn about the Bible, being able to learn how to pray, um, what kind of relationship I could have with God, it really appealed to me. It gave me stability, security, and a family that I did not have. Um, and I think that's especially what the appeal was of the Watchtower Society back then, of the Jehovah's Witnesses community. That's that family, that brotherhood, that global brotherhood, um, the, the seeming sincerity uh, of which I'm sure there were many individually that were, but the, the love bombing tactics that witnesses are told to do, that really draws people in that come from chaotic, unstable backgrounds. And it was a different organization oh, back then. Different. The organization that it became, um, I mean, I understand that when I started going to the Kingdom Hall, I was young. Which was around? 82, 83. So it was right after, uh, right around the time that um, Raymond Franz was removed from Bethel and ended up getting disfellowshipped. And, um, but the organization itself went through a, quite a growth spurt at that time. And the <clears throat> governing body was something you barely even heard about and knew about so it was more about the family within the congregation um, there was obviously no internet at the time so you didn't you had a, a concept of the worldwide brotherhood but it was more about the family-like atmosphere within the organization and um, there was a family down the street that had a daughter who was only a month younger than me. She went to the same school as me. And we really hit it off. Um, poor girl was quite shocking when she first started hanging around with me because I grew up in a house where the language was atrocious. And I may have only been 10 or 11 years old. But I, had a, I had the mouth of a sailor. I had way more experience with boys than I should have. I'd been exposed to way more stuff than a child that age should be exposed to. So, but her family was, you know, the mother, the father, the um, kids. It was very warm and loving, and it's everything I always wanted in my family. So, <clears throat> there was the only difficulty for me was adjusting to. In school, I don't know why they call it like this, going out with boys. We didn't go anywhere. We didn't do anything. But anyway, you had boyfriends one after another, going to school dances, wearing makeup, and things I never would have allowed a daughter to do. But I never had any interest in going out with boys or wearing makeup, personally. <laughs> Mini skirts. And... Yeah, maybe. No. <laughs> um... <clears throat> don't think about that. <laughs> no, 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 no. So the organization gave me that, it filled that spiritual desire um, that I had. And it also gave me that stable, secure family environment that I desperately wanted as a child. And even though my parents, they studied for a little while and then my father got um, busted for selling drugs so he did a little time in prison, and that put a hold on his Bible study. Is that the one where the weed showed up, but the cocaine never did? Yeah, he got busted for 20 pounds of marijuana, and I don't know how much cocaine, and cocaine disappeared. But he went to jail for the marijuana. 
Um, and that was a traumatic experience because we had come home from grocery shopping and the police raided the house and, you know, they had my mother, my mother had no idea what was going on. He didn't tell anyone in the family. So the police have her up against the wall with a gun to her head. And it was terrifying as a child to see that and not understand what was going on, which of course that kind of lifestyle, they sold drugs from the house and, you know, on the weekends there'd be I'd have to go get my mother to get the guys who were snorting coke in the bathroom out of the bathroom so that we could go pee or in the middle of the night, you know, mom, I have to go pee, but dad's head's in the toilet. And so anyway, it was when he got out of prison, um, he got work release and a brother in the congregation gave him some work. And he'd only been working for a short time. And one day there was a young man there who was one of Jehovah's Witnesses. He had just been married a month and he was electrocuted. The electricity jumped from the wire to his ladder. That's when CMP started talking about boots on wires and stuff. It was a big lawsuit and everything, but he died. He was 20 something years old, been married a month and he was killed right in front of my father. And it just, it really shocked him. It just really hurt him and scared him. And he decided that he had to stop playing around and take studying the Bible seriously. And so all of a sudden they went from studying and kind of bringing us to meetings to all of a sudden we're all in on this, the whole family no if, ands, or buts. So on one hand, it was great because I, I wanted that religious thing. But then again, all of a sudden I had to give up all my friends going to dances, the way I dressed, the music I listened to it, my entire world changed, but it was enough of a compensation having that family environment. And I did have that friend who lived just five houses down that made the transition. Gave you easier. some kind of anchor. And exactly. Storm. It was an anchor that I had, and I could spend a lot of time there um, because the transition was challenging for my family. We had never gone on a family vacation together. My father had never done any family trip with us. My mother did, and my grandparents did, but my father had never gone along. So all of a sudden, they were having to learn how to be a family without drugs, without drinking, without partying. And for a while, it seemed like it would get better, but they never let go of what they called the good old days. So even though my father eventually became an elder, my mother pioneered for a while. Um, the environment at home was not peaceful. There was a constant undercurrent. Yeah, it's at the kingdom hall in front of other people, there was this image, but at home, there was a whole nother thing. And which is the way it is with witnesses. You're, yeah. you have a presenter persona that you have at the kingdom hall or out in the ministry and with individual clicks of witnesses as well. You will act one way with some people and a different way with other people that you're more or less comfortable with, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. And <clears throat> my father had a drinking issue and never really gave that up. Um, he did. I don't think he had a problem with it. I think he was fine with it. Oh yeah, he was fine with it. <laughs> um, he, he gave it up for a little while, but then started drinking again. But as a young person who very much wanted to live the way the Bible did, I was very much um, black and white, which I'm still pretty black and white, but I have the maturity now to at least try to temper myself. And as a teenager, I did not. And I desperately wanted our family to be what they were, what I felt they were supposed to be according to the truth. And but that's always changing. Yes. With the truth, it's constantly changing. Yeah. So how can you be so black and white? and yet have that constant teaching and doctrinal yeah. adjustment or outright throw it out the window and move something new. As and well as depending on who is the 
presiding overseer, or now I think it's co congregation co co coordinator. Kobe? Congregation coordinator, or whatever. I always thought of nice stakes when I heard the term Kobe. I don't remember what it stands for. Um, co congregation coordinator, but it used to be the presiding overseer. Um, I think that's what it was when I started going to the meeting. Maybe it was something else at the time, but depending on which elder you talked with, depending on who your book study conductor was, would affect the tone of what was acceptable and what was not acceptable. Didn't you miss book study went one way? Oh, I did. I cried. I really, really, really loved the personal um, aspect of having a book study. Um, Would you rather they gotten rid of the Thursday meeting or uh, the theocratic oh, ministry yeah. school and oh, everything, yeah. whatever day it was held on? Yeah. For the viewers? Um, so even though the family there was a frustration that it didn't the family never got to be where i wanted it and it was so volatile at home and stressful and without getting into all that the stress was such that i actually had a nervous breakdown in high school i didn't know that's what it was at the time my doctor described it as you know your brain can can only handle so much emotion and so much going on and at some point your body will just shut down because I was blacking out. Um, Michelle has stopped working. Please turn on your Michelle again. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, please reboot. Yeah. Error 404. Yeah. So it just made me cling all the more to the organization and the families that were helpful within the organization because what I was getting at home, um, what was happening. And as a teenager, I couldn't it just was so frustrating because I didn't drink. I didn't smoke. I was doing everything a good witness should do. I didn't lie. I didn't sneak around. Um, if I said I was going to the mall with my friend, that's exactly what we did. We didn't meet boys. We didn't do anything we weren't supposed to do. So in your heart, you were genuinely trying to turn around. I was trying to live. Your upbringing. Yes. Yeah. And I was trying to live as a good Christian should, as a good witness should. I helped out a lot around the house and, you know, I was a teenager. I had attitude and I definitely had an issue with, if I'm feeling it, it's on my face. And boy, did that get me in trouble a lot. Um, unlike my son who has a superb poker face, <laughs> I did not. And I could... The inner machinations of my mind can be an enigma. Yes. Um, and I could and would argue to the death if I felt I was right, which you did inherit that from me. Yeah, they called me the little lawyer. Yeah, our, our little lawyer. Um, so, you know, I was a teenager and in a frustrating situation. So I'm sure every parent's just trying to figure it out. They're trying to do the best they can in bringing up their kids. And my parents, I'm sure, were having a deep battle. I don't think my mother really wanted to be in the organization pretty much from the beginning. I could be wrong, but I think she went along more or less. My father has a stronger personality. My mother's more um, willing to bend. You mean your stepfather, right? Mm, yeah, I guess so. Um, yeah. He raised me since I was four, so and was way more of a father than my biological father. But <clears throat> so the more volatile it was at home, the more attracted I was to the organization, and the more bound and determined I would stay with the organization. Yeah. And I, I think that's what attracts a lot of people is they come from messed up backgrounds. They, yeah. so to speak, they go from the fire to the frying pan of the organization. Yes. Yeah. And at that time, it was, for me, looking back on it, coming into the organization, I believe was absolutely the best thing for me because of the, the environment I was growing up in. And all the girls that I hung around with were having sex by 13, 14. Um, more than one had an abortion. One, her first sexual experience, she was raped because um, she was drunk at a party and the boy took advantage of her. Um, I had four or five girls, and this was in the 80s, four or five girls that I went to school with in my 
grade got pregnant. One of them got pregnant at 14, had complications after the delivery and had a hysterectomy. So she was then 15 years old and would never have another child. These were the kids that I grew up with, all the girls I hung around with. So from your experience and your perspective, you have these examples of what JWs would call worldly people and the fruits of a worldly life. And that helped justify and solidify in your Absolutely. mind being a part of yep. the Watchtower. I grew up with, you know, the drugs. I was never attracted to drugs. I got drunk once, which is sad considering I was 10. Horrible experience. Not keen to try that again. I don't understand how people can do it over and over and over, that hangover no, experience. It was horrible. I was smoking at 10 years old, regularly smoking. Um, tried drugs, um, not pills, but the um, smoking pot. My parents dealt it, so it was always there. My father actually took me to see, had to have been the second Star Wars movie. Empire Strikes Back and got me high beforehand, and that was in 82. No. 80? Quality dad time. Yeah, yeah, quality. Let's Did he at least buy munchies? <laughs> I don't really remember the movie, so I'm assuming. It's the best that, one. How can you not remember it? Because my father got me high, so I, I had to okay, have been so... really young. So what on earth possessed him? But anyway. Because of that environment growing up, and then the way my parents handled being in the organization, it just pushed me further and further away from what they did. But looking at it, regardless of what the organization became, regardless of what anything, from my personal experience, and then, you know, I, I think in another video we'll get onto other situations that happened in life. Being in the organization for me was actually a good thing. I don't regret having come into the organization at that age because I really truly believe it saved me from a lot of heartache. I had daddy issues because of my two fathers, so I was incredibly insecure. Always went for the bad boy. From the time I was little... Still did, even after you came in. Yeah, that's true. I, I married a Good man, uh, witness, bad boy. Questionable man. Yeah, good man, but a bad boy um, with his own dysfunctional issues from growing up that, of course, neither one of us have any idea we had at the time. But um, I always wanted from as long as I can remember to grow up to have a family. I desperately wanted that family, the, the mother, the father, to have children. Um, and the halls that you were in, you kind of got that. I did. I did. Um, I was able to babysit a lot. I had a lot of good families I could hang around with. And because of that, well, because of that desire, the organization really, um, it fed what I needed. It fed what I wanted. And it was what was satiating you at the time. Yep. Yeah. And, and I, if I had not had it with all, I think about the friends that I had that got pregnant in high school and two of them got pregnant because their friends got pregnant. What would I have done? What kind of boyfriends would I have had? Would I have ended up getting pregnant like they did? Or disease. Or disease or, you know, who knows? We used to, um, a friend of mine before... I came into the organization, my best friend at the time, we used to sneak out her parents, um, her stepfather drank, her mother did drugs, and she would pass out, drink and do drugs. And we lived right on the beach of a um, tourist town. And we used to go out and hang out. I mean, it is horrifying as a mother now looking back and thinking what this 10 year old girl was doing. It was a beach town, forest town, pier, everything bars, like that. Bars, clubs, bars, strip clubs. clubs. Um, it's cleaned up some since then, but when I was growing up, there was lots of strip clubs and bars and the horrible things that could have happened to me is terrifying to think of 
from a mother's point of view. So again, it just where my life was heading because of my upbringing is very scary to me. And without the organization, um, I would have had a lot more trauma, I think, and difficulties that I would have had to deal with if I had not had it, not been in the organization. Of course, then I wouldn't have met my husband and I wouldn't have had my baby. So I, I can't regret having become one of Jehovah's Witnesses for a time. Hmm. Well, that's, that's something where I've seen only a relative handful of other former JWs talk about how they don't necessarily have all regret and that it wasn't all bad. And they're not I'm deeply not embittered. Yeah. That's, that's a lot of former witnesses are very bitter, very angry. They left the watchtower, but the watchtower hasn't left them. They're still mm -hmm. holding on to that. And this is just an example of that doesn't need to happen. It only hurts that in, that, that person, that individual. And it's, it's not that I can't look back and think of lots of... BS. Yeah, and very negative things that happened that were traumatizing, that were for both my husband and I. We definitely have a list of things that were really bad within the organization, but... Future videos. Yeah. When I look at where we are as a family now, how much we've learned, how much we've grown, and even those... I mean, some of the experiences were devastating devastating that we went through but we learned some things that were so vital and now and and aided us in where we are now with the personal relationship we have with no interference with our heavenly father and our savior aided and abetted apostasy yes exactly um the spiritual life that we're able to live now Again, I, I like to look back and I like to see, yes, there were horrible things that happened. But we were able to grow and learn from them and become stronger. Um, we learned endurance. We learned integrity. Um, I mean, I'd still tell people now, don't stay away. Don't get into the organization and obviously direct people to a true spiritual focus and relationship, um, but just not through the organization. But personally, for me and my experiences, um, I'm not grateful to the organization, but I'm grateful f for. Well, who is organization? Can you can you put them on the phone? Um, no. Uh, <laughs> so no. you're grateful. To be it's funny because growing up, I remember one of the elders, he was a really good man. And actually when we left it, it, that Steve? Yeah, yeah. it hurt my heart knowing how devastated he was going to be when he heard that I left the organization because he was a real saving grace for me through the turmoil of what my family was going through. He was someone I could talk to. He recognized what was really going on. Um, but he used to call the organization mother. And it didn't hit register at the time until after we left the organization. What do you mean, mother? He, he was part. Don't talk about a mother. He was part of that generation of older men that used that term that they called organization mother, and then you had father, of course, who's yeah. allegedly. But it was gone. always we need to listen to mother. We need to follow mother. The and core is mother. The core is father. Yes, exactly. I had no. You know, of course, I was ten years old when I started you know, the initial Bible study and 11 when I had more of a diligent Bible study. And, you know, that's that's pretty young when you have no spiritual understanding, no understanding of the scriptures other than... Which is how Watchtower recruited people, people that don't have a lot of spiritual knowledge or direction or... You're indoctrinated from the very beginning and you have no idea. So when something like that happens you know, like referring to the organization as mother, it didn't, 
Never registered as any No red issue. flags because you didn't have anything to compare it to? No. Nope. I mean, I was a teenager and I respected this man. And if that's what the organization calls it. And at that time, when we first started coming in, excuse me, Raymond Franz had, like I said, just that whole Bethel thing, the apostasy. And all I heard about him was he was just pretty much the most evil apostate that ever. But, but you never heard about, uh, is it Greenleaf's? No, nope, never, never heard, heard a word them. about Greenleaf's. And was, that was in the mid eighties, I think. I think oh, so. Right? It was a little after. After Raymond Franz. Yeah, after Raymond Franz. And I remember going to, our first convention was Montreal. So, oh, really? Yeah, it was a our first Van family vacation anywhere together. It was a convention in Montreal. <laughs> And, but each convention for quite a few years, I remember um, protesters outside the convention and Raymond Franz, I remember the name being up on a lot of them. And all I knew from what we were taught. How quickly. Was, oh, we don't talk about him. Yeah. yeah. How quickly did we, they try to erase him? Because obviously they didn't have a website or broadcasting. Back I'm not then. even sure how we heard about him. Hmm. It must have been just it was on people's mind because it was literally had just happened. And but people were so venomous, paranoid about um, apostates, which now we understand, you know, that they're not really apostates. But well, um, the technical definition of an apostate is anyone who leaves their political ideology, religion. Or organization for another so that would include nathan yeah, nor so. and charles Faze russell and... yeah, yeah yeah but the there was a lot of paranoia about you don't speak against the organization you don't we trust mother we trust and we obey and because if you don't you know it's danger danger will robinson um, stranger danger yeah, stranger danger. Um, but again, there was no, there was no internet or anything. So all we had was to take their word for it. And we You're had, scaring the no, young ones, by the way. You keep saying that phrase, no internet. There was a time before there was internet. <laughs> and there was a time before there was wireless internet. We had no remote controls. That's how old I am. You had to get control. up we off of your butt, phone. put your Cheetos aside and change <laughs> the channel. No, if you wanted to get a snack or go to the bathroom, you had to do it in, during a commercial. Yes, there are these things called commercials. <laughs> now, you think of them as ads now, but these were commercials. They were programmed in, so there's probably about 10 minutes of show and 40 minutes of commercials, right? I don't know. I remember having to move really quickly to jump up, go to the bathroom, get your snack and get a drink or whatever, and make it back in time for the show. And if you missed it, you're done. There was no DVR. There was no VCR. There was no. There were no reruns. <laughs> I, I might be part of the last generation that remembers surfing between the Disney Channel and Nickelodeon and Cartoon Network, like during commercials, and trying to time and balance all the different shows oh, yeah. that I was watching. Yeah. Yeah, I like. I remember when HBO came out, um, and you had that controller with the little dial thing on there. Cinema, no, Cinemax wasn't out yet. MTV, I remember when that started. When it actually when played it music. music. It was actually music back then. Um, but I remember when the television turned off at night and you had to wait like Saturday mornings, you'd be sitting there waiting for the, what was it called? It had a pattern on the screen and I can't remember what it was called. The color bars? Yeah. You had to wait for the cartoons to come on because there was no and then HBO came out, and that, I think, ran all night. But that was another thing. We had no supervision on the weekends. Like, my grandmother lived upstairs, but she was elderly. My um, father's mother, so step-grandmother. <clears throat> and when I, by 10 years old, a lot of times, I watched my brother, who was five years younger than me. And she would be upstairs if we needed her. But... Um, that meant there was no supervision. So some of the shows that we watched. Um, was that Hebert? Yeah. Some of the shows that we watched were inc 
spread, well, they're not appropriate for an adult, in my opinion, um, let alone for a 10 year old or a five year old, because my brother um, was there. He used to look through the Playboy magazines while he was going to the bathroom. Of course he did. Yep, so good education on that. Yep, so next time maybe we'll talk about a little bit more about your parents and that situation or your great grand or my great grandparents, your grandparents. Okay. All right. So this was the first interview video, but there's a lot more to talk about. So I hope you all enjoy it, that you drew inspiration or maybe it resonates with you and that you all have a good day.